Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, morning Ritman. <laughs> Happy Father's Day. Happy uh, Father's thank you. Day. Thank you. No, to everyone who uh, is a father, has served in that role as a father, has supported fathers, uh, has been a wonderful child to respect their fathers. Thank you, especially. Uh, this is a special day. We will talk a little bit about why Jesus referred to God as his own father and how that ideal is presented to us for a reason and how even though we might fall short of that ideal, we should never stop trying. And I want to begin our call to worship this morning. Uh, but before we do so, I want to open with a, a welcome uh, and announcements. I want to... Uh, Thank you all for coming out. It will be a warm one today. Uh, I don't have too much breeze dialed up right now, uh, but it looks like you all found the shady spots in the lawn, so I will direct my attention there. Thank you for moving your cars off, off there because the glare was uh, getting pretty bad. But I have a few uh, good announcements and a few uh, prayer requests for sure. First, in terms of uh, prayer requests, we will leave some time towards the end of the service to lift up uh, people in prayer, both silently or out loud, uh, in our hearts, and as we do so, think about those who are in need of prayer or uh, to give thanks as well. I know this is a very special Father's Day for my friend Ben. He had his first uh, child, a daughter, uh, yesterday. Uh, I also uh, want to congratulate uh, Nate Seidel and Colleen Hart. They were married yesterday on a small ceremony. They wanted that to be a bigger ceremony, but because of the coronavirus, they have uh, moved that later into October. But they had a wonderful, uh, smaller, intimate ceremony, and so they are officially married. If you could congratulate them, uh, if you see them or write them a card, I can uh, let you know their address or their parents can too. So, and congratulations, uh, Ron and Kim, on your uh, daughter's marriage. It's a beautiful thing. We will pray for them, for sure. <laughs> And I also want us to make sure to pray for Lonnie Fletcher. He had to go to the hospital uh, on health complications, and so uh, we will certainly keep him in our prayers as well. Are there any other prayer requests or announcements that anyone would like to share with me uh, before we start the service? Yes, uh, we'll start with Cindy, then we'll uh, go to Kim. I was just going to say, remember uh, prayers for Bill Timmons yes, as he heals. Sure. Yeah, we will continue to pray for Bill. He is recovering. He is being taken care of well. Um, but nonetheless, it is, it is a long road to, to get back. So, yes, Ken. And then my friend Joyce Wilson, her mother passed away. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. Uh, so we will keep Joyce Wilson in our prayers as well. Any other uh, announcements? Or prayer request. At this time, I would like us uh, to join together in thinking about God's Word. And I will read our call to worship this morning. This from John's Gospel, chapter 17, verses 10 to 11. Jesus is praying to God for his disciples and for his own strength at his time of trial. And specifically, he is talking about uh, his disciples and his followers in this prayer, in this part of the prayer. This is God's word. Listen attentively and let it permeate your hearts. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine. And glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so they may be one as we are one. This is a holy wisdom and a holy word. Thanks be to God. And knowing God's holiness, the Holy Father, and how we are to be one with that, even as we are in the world, as we prepare ourselves for that, uh, we, Joe and I will sing together. Uh, this is my Father's world, our opening hymn. I know that you all are really getting ready to sing and you want to. Uh, we will get there eventually, uh, but for now, Joe and I will have all the fun today. So. <laughs> yes. 
Sounds good. All right, let me plug you in. Yeah, I'm on. Yeah, am on. Yeah, you're on. All right, good. Hello. Yep. <laughs> this is my father's world, and to my listening ears, all nature sings around me rings. The music of the spheres. This is my father's world. I rest in the thought of rocks and trees, of skies and seas. His hand the wonders wrought. Is my father's world. The birds their carols raise. The morning light, the lily white, declare their maker's praise. This is my father's world. He shines in all that's fair. In the rustling grass I hear him pass. He speaks to me everywhere. This is my father's world. Oh, let me never forget. That for the wrong seems oft so strong, God is a ruler yet. This is my father's world. The battle is not done. Jesus, who dies, shall be satisfied, and earth and heaven be one. Thank you. Good job, Joe. Yeah. Yes, Joe and I have had fun this week. We've gotten to practice together. We've gotten to sing together. It feels good. I've missed it. I know it's still... Uh, I don't know when we all can sing together. I want to be cautious on that, but I uh, certainly... We will, throughout the summer, and we will have uh, people be able to sing uh, for us in the congregation. Now, uh, before we get to our children's moment, which again, uh, many of you will uh, serve as our children, so we will tap into how we are young at heart. I want us to prepare our hearts and minds for our scripture lessons uh, this morning. Our first scripture lesson comes from the book of Leviticus. Chapter 19, verses 1 to 4. Listen now for this word. The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the entire assembly of Israel and say to them, Be holy, because I, the Lord, your God, am holy. Each of you must respect your mother and father, and you must observe my Sabbaths. I am the Lord, your God. Do not turn to idols or make metal gods for yourselves. I am the Lord, your God. This is a holy wisdom and a holy word. Thanks to you, God. I realized I subconsciously pointed uh, to myself, and that's not correct. God is above. God is all around. This is where we need to listen. Our second scripture lesson is from Matthew on Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. It's Matthew 5, 43 to 48. Listen now for these challenging words that we must all remember always. You have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what re reward will you get? 
Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than the others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. This is a holy wisdom and a holy word. Thanks, Thanks be to God. All right, children, come on in. Listen now. This is a good word. I have some questions. I know that uh, last Sunday I was very happy with the engagement that I uh, received from the kids. I was also greatly challenged by your questions and answers, which is how it should be. So my first question to you is, uh, have you ever had a, a father or a father figure or a, a man who is older in your life um, who, who really was a good example on things. And I want you to think of how that person was a good example. And I want you to give me some examples of them being a good example. Does anyone want to volunteer anything at all right now? Yes, Samantha. And you can take your mask off as you uh, give this example. <laughs> um, my father figure, his name is Justin. Um, he was one of my foster fathers. Um, he set a good example by teaching me different, like how to do different things, and by helping me with my schoolwork and stuff to kind of understand what to do. No, that's, that's a beautiful example. Her father uh, figure is Justin, who is one of her fa foster fathers, helped her with her schoolwork and helped teach her things uh, that to help her understand. That's what a good, a good father does. Thank you for sharing that example. Yes, Kim. My dad taught me how to tie my shoes when I was little. And taught me to, you know, and he was patient with me. And he taught me how to tie my shoes Good. Kim's dad taught her how to tie her shoes when she was little. He's very patient with helping her tie those shoes. That's why she's wearing buckle sandals. This <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, that's a... Yeah, yeah, listen, I've forgotten quite a bit, actually. No, that's a beautiful example. It takes a lot of patience. We will get there when we get there. I also want to thank Andrea uh, as well, because we had filmed uh, the Virtual Junior Church, which has been posted, and I will send an email out about that later. She told the story about her own uh, father who uh, gave his life to protect others uh, when she was a very young. Uh, he uh, passed in the Marshallville uh, si silo fire uh, helping uh, save a, a number of other people and I really appreciate that ultimate example uh, that we have. And Of course that is exactly what Jesus had given to us. Now I have one other uh, question and uh, you don't have to vocalize this out loud but has any of you witnessed a father or a father figure setting a, uh, a less than perfect example, a not so great example? Okay, we won't name names here. But I am sure that some of us know when that father or father figure has made mistakes. I myself am stumbling my way through fatherhood with a lot of help from my friends and my wife and uh, my family. And that is where we fall short. But Jesus called God his father because he wanted to retain those good examples, to have a pure example of someone who loved. And Jesus' example that he used in teaching was that God created this world and God loves everybody, even those who might not love God. And God takes care of them through the world, through the sun rising upon them and the rain falling upon them. God provides. That is the example that we too are to follow. Will you please join me in prayer? Lord in heaven, thank you for giving us this example of righteousness. And Lord, Although we will fall short, we must always keep trying. Lord, we pray for your forgiveness and mercy when we do fall short of your standard. 
But Lord, we give you thanks for this word and for these hearts that convict us so that we may be strong in your spirit and your sight so we may look up to you as a pure father. Amen. Now, I want to ask, how many times in your life have you heard this statement? I am going to make an example out of you. I don't know if some of you have had flashbacks right there. And I don't know if it was directed towards your brother or sister, or uh, maybe it was directed towards a teammate or a co-worker. <clears throat> maybe it was directed towards you, and you could have that privilege of serving as the example that is made. And maybe you were the one who said it. I don't know. And more often than not, discipline would follow. And I'm not going to speculate over what form this discipline took. I'm not here to get anyone or their parents or their coaches in trouble. Uh, but the possibilities are endless. But usually, I have to say, if you had to serve it as an example through discipline... The discipline to follow would probably be somewhat merciless because it had to be in order to deter others who witnessed the punishment so there would be no need for further discipline. In many respects, that example was a blessing to others if you were the one who had to bear it uh, in order to spare them for, from such a consequence. And this is why throughout the history of humankind, punishment was far more public than private. And at least then the punishment was honest because it was in the open. But those words, I will make an example of you, would come to be dreaded. And uh, more often than not, those uh, that punishment would be the result of uh, breaking the rules of an orderly society, of, of failing to properly heed authority. And uh, since it is Father's Day, I will of course, uh, go back to the, the verse that I've shared with you a number of times that my father would share with me in church in the sort of tongue-in-cheek ways, pointing out that the law, a law that sanctioned in extreme cases the public execution of rebellious children in the town square. The conclusion reads, You must purge the evil from among you. All Israel will hear it and be afraid. Now, even though my dad uh, would bring this up very tongue-in-cheek, it's a real example of, of setting an example in the worst sense so that it would never happen again. I honestly don't know how often that this might have happened. It might have never happened. The point is that the word is there and the seriousness is there. The example is in the word. The rules set out were meant to be followed and their importance was set out in the beginning of Leviticus that was read this morning. And whenever teaching children, I have learned from much wiser people that repetition is important. And this verse in Leviticus is no different. Uh, this is no different than the, from the important laws in Scripture. The most important ones were repeated. And some of the most important ones came from this chapter in Leviticus, whose beginning we read aloud this morning. Some of the laws, such as purity rules, about not sewing two different types of fabric together, or not sowing the same field with two different kinds of seeds, were less memorable and do not come back up in our scriptures. But written alongside these laws are ones that have a deeper root of spiritual truth. And this is truth that we see more clearly after Jesus and his followers emphasize them throughout the New Testament. And they read, Do not hate a fellow Israelite in your heart. Rebuke your neighbor frankly, so you will not share in their guilt. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. I'm, it's, you love your neighbor as yourself. That's where that part of the greatest commandment comes from. They follow the beginning of the chapter that reminds everyone three of the most basic commandments from the first ten. Each of you must respect your father and mother, and you must observe my Sabbaths. I am the Lord your God. Do not turn to idols or make metal gods for yourselves. I am the Lord your God. You must respect your father and mother. You must observe my Sabbath, and you must not turn to idols 
or make metal gods for yourselves, followed later by the command not to bear a grudge against neighbor and to love your neighbor as yourselves. At first glance, these are important laws that are repeated throughout the, the New Testament, but they also might seem unrelated. They are a collection of good rules that should be taken individually, and each one followed and respected of its own merit. Um, and at the same time, some are very current, while others might seem more outdated. And this truth can be seen in Jesus' own teachings as well, as he is accused of breaking some of those laws, particularly the Sabbath laws. Jesus would get in trouble when he would do pretty urgent things, which is help people and heal people on the Sabbath. Uh, sometimes his followers once were accused of picking grain on the Sabbath. And some of these things were, they were always needed. Jesus didn't get in trouble for playing golf on the Sabbath, even though he definitely would have. There was no golf back then. But Jesus would always be doing things that were necessary. And the, uh, But he got in trouble for breaking those laws, and, and those seem now to be a little antiquated in some respects. To some, I think they're important. But uh, certainly you should not hate. Certainly you should not bear a grudge. Certainly you should love your neighbor. But do we really need to refrain from sewing two different types of materials together? Every one of you who is wearing a mask would be violating that uh, material. Uh, would, that would be violating that pro provision. Uh, most of us would... Uh, our clothes are usually made of uh, two different materials. Uh, so, do we need to strictly follow those? Do we still need to strictly observe the Sabbath? Are idols really such a threat? Do we still need to respect our fathers and mothers? Really? Happy Father's Day. But but these laws, I, I only say so half jokingly, but these laws have their place, and the most consistently serious and important laws had to do with this uh, odd thing called idol worship. And nowadays, a lot of modern preachers very sincerely um, uh, preach on this as a teaching on our priorities, extending idols as defining many different activities that we prioritize over God, taking our attention and focus away from God. But uh, today I want to talk about this law, exactly how it is written. Not seeing idols as an allegory for something more, but idols as statues and images with power and importance. Because these images often project a power and hold a power they shouldn't. Because this power is reserved for God alone. They evoke a powerful feelings in people. In, in the ancient world, statues of gods, whether bulls or ravens or other animal spirits, would invite the spirit of the god to inhabit them and bless the people. This is how people used to worship in polytheistic communities. In some Hindu uh, practices, this still happens today. Food is offered to these statues of gods. And there is a reason why God said, destroy false idols and make no graven image of me. God did not want people to hold or sculpt this power to their own will or view or understanding. God did not want people to shape him in their own view of the truth. Because God knew that any image presented would fall far short of reality. And the ideal truth which is shaped and is still being shaped is present not in an image or a statue or a singular entity, but in all of creation. That is where Jesus pulls the images he uses to teach us. And that is why throughout Christian history there have been people known as iconoclasts those who believe that any devotional image or images of God should be destroyed, and so they do, because these images did not project, project the truth that could not be projected in any image. In fact, it could easily be distorted by a visual, a visual representation destined to fall short of an ideal. Now, in our own country today, we have seen examples of recent iconoclasts destroying uh, not, not statues of reverence, per se, but removing statues of importance of Confederate leaders throughout city squares 
and public places, especially in the southern part of our country. And this has sparked a new and emotional debate on the nature of public sculpture and the reputation of historical figures that inhabit public spaces. Uh, those who take down the sculptures argue that these images went hand in hand with racist laws put into place just after the slaves were freed in order to suppress and separate. It is argued that they were an homage to racist ideals and racist people and should be removed. Now the other side, uh, on the other side, there are uh, others who lament, lament the rewriting of history, of the destruction of history and culture. They point to the ideals of freedom and the parts of, of Southern history that should not be ignored or erased, that are represented in these monuments. They ask themselves, if we take this step, what part of traditional culture will be left? If we take this step, what will happen in the next, next step when other figures who helped lead our country are found with sin? What will happen to the Lincoln Memorial when people point to the dreadful and sinful treatment of Native Americans when he was in office? What will happen to the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial if more details came out about his possible sexual sin? What will happen? Whose legacy will be left standing when the dust settles? Should people really demand perfection and perfect morality from everybody who is publicly honored? Maybe. I don't know. All I know is that there is somebody whom we follow who does ask that perfection of us. And that is exactly why images and images of ideals and people in their ideals can be dangerous. Because they hold more power than maybe they should one way or another. Now in my own view, these symbols should not hold that sort of reverence or power. They are representations of imperfect people who have led in different ways. Now, that is why the Lord prohibited such idols and prohibited making idols from people. Statues are static. Like Shelley's elegy to the great statue Ozymandias, whose ironic words of awesome power were all that remained of a majestic monument lying in ruin. In the end, these images won't matter. They won't last. And his is just one example among many whose idealistic words fell short because they did not reflect the ultimate truth of the individual represented, even if those words themselves represented a greater and more eternal truth. It's the words and the ideals that are lifted up because the figure will always fall short in one way or another. So those examples, so whose example do we look to when it comes to our own guidance? Is there anyone who is a perfect example of life? Is it worth trying? Well, Jesus says it is. This is why he teaches, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. He teaches this knowing full well that we will fall short, which is why you have to have mercy and forgiveness in a very unnatural way in order to strive for this perfection. It echoes the words that began our chapter of rules in Leviticus, Be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. Jesus wants God to make an example of us. He wants to shape us into an example of holiness and those who are pure in heart. He wants to shape us into an example of forgiveness and transcendent, undeserved mercy. He wants to shape us into an example of faith. So how do we accomplish this unreasonable task? <laughs> Where do we start? We simply try every day. How do we begin to try? Well, we try by listening to the words of our own teacher, Jesus. You have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. 
this is hard. When I was talking about God and, and Jesus and making an example of people, God made an example of Jesus, His only Son, in one of the most unsettling ways, if you think about it. If you think about it. He transformed the notion of justice itself as Jesus took on a punishment directed not towards Him, but other people. What sort of example is this from a pure God, from a pure Father? This doesn't make sense in our worldly terms, not in mine at least, not in my worldly morality, for somebody to, to bear the punishment of somebody else. That doesn't sound like justice. And it's not. It's mercy. And, but what Jesus does is give us an example of having the strength to shield others who also do not deserve such mercy. He did this. Because he loved them. Jesus loved them. God so loved the world that he did this. He did this because he taught us to love our enemies and not hate them. To know that there is always a chance of redemption. And honestly, you may not have heard love your friends but hate your enemies. I haven't heard that. But I see it demonstrated in rhetoric and the words people use from very public leaders all the time. Hateful words, disrespectful words from people who have a platform to do so because it seems like a winning strategy. So much of our political discourse is becoming more and more geared towards self-righteous judgment upon others. The cultural critic Arthur Brooks wrote a really great book uh, called loving your enemies, pretty straightforward, and he, and he lives in that political world and has talked about how political divides have split up families today in, in ways they haven't in the past, particularly as it pertains to our own hyper-partisan age. And he, he bemoans this trend and seeks to present evidence that loving your enemies can bring about a revolutionary sea change in how we see. And he writes that when I talk about love in this book, I am describing not something that is fuzzy or sentimental, but very clear embracing. In his Summa Theologica, St. Thomas Aquinas said, to love is to will the good of the other. Uh, but the modern philosopher Michael Novak refines this further by adding two words. To love is to will the good of the other as other. Love is not sentimental, nor restful in illusions, but watchful, alert, and ready to follow evidence. And the evidence for loving your enemies actually exists. This is anything but a naive solution. It is the only solution that can last forever. Every other solution will come back around and fail and consume itself because of the discord that is shown. In his best-selling classic, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, Stephen Covey recounts how a man came to one of his seminars and told him, Look at my marriage. I am really worried. My wife and I just don't have the same feelings for each other that we used to have. I guess I just don't love her anymore. And I guess she doesn't love me. What can I do? Covey told him the answer was simple. He should love her. But the man protested, he didn't feel love anymore. How do you love when you don't love, the man asked. My friend, Covey replied, love is a verb. Love is the feeling, uh, love the feeling is a fruit of love the verb. Lo uh, so love her, serve her, sacrifice, listen to her, empathize appreciate, affirm her. If he does those things, if he treated her with love, he would feel love again. Because feelings follow action. If our feelings control our actions, is it, it is because we have abdicated our responsibility and empowered them to do so. Reactive people make love a feeling. Proactive people make love a verb. Love is something you do, the sacrifices you make, the giving of self. 
This giving of self is the example that Jesus sets for us. And Jesus himself got this example from his Father, the Lord. Jesus gave us an example of God's love, not from a statue or an image of God. Jesus points not to an image that is crafted or created that will point to a specific entity. Jesus points to God's truth through loving existence and action. Jesus points to God's creation. He points to God's verb. He causes his son to rise on the evil and good and sends rain on the evil and the righteous. On the righteous and the unrighteous. The image isn't crafted by us. The image is with us every day as surely as the sun rises and the rain falls. God takes care of those who are deserving and those who are undeserving because they are his children to be loved. But if you want to be recognized as God's children, you strive to follow God's example by treating everybody with that same love and dignity. Now I want to respond to this with a with a song this uh, song is uh, written by uh, Dan Dean from the group of Phillips Craig and Dean who sang it it's called I want to be just like you and it's a powerful picture of what it means to be a holy example for those who look to you who see how you live your life especially those whom you are around the most. You know, that, that includes your husbands, your wives, your spouses, your children, your brothers and sisters. You should speak to every one of us. And so Joe and I will, will play this and sing. I want to thank Joe as well for uh, coming in and helping me practice. Are you uh, plugged in, Joe? Or... Oh, no, you're not. I saw your mic on. All right. Good. That good? Yeah. He climbs on my lap for a good night hug. He calls me daddy and I call him bub. With his faded old pillow and a bear named Pooh. Snuggles up close and says, I want to be like you. I tuck him in bed and I kiss him goodnight. Tripping over the toys as I turn out the light. I whisper a prayer that someday he'll see. He's got a father in God because he's seen Jesus in me. Lord, I want to be just like you, cause he wants to be just like me. I want to be a holy example for his innocent eyes to see. Help me be a living Bible, Lord, that my little boy can read. I've got so far to go Make so many mistakes As I'm sure that you know Sometimes it seems No matter how hard I try With all the pressures in life I just can't get it all right But I'm trying so hard To learn from the best Being patient and kind Filled with your tenderness I know that he'll learn from the things that he sees and the Jesus he finds will be the Jesus. 
Jesus in me. Lord, I want to be just like you, because he wants to be just like me. Just like you, cause he wants to be like me. Thank you. I really enjoyed singing that and really enjoyed practicing it. Thank you, Andrea, for introducing me to that beautiful song and uh, thank you Joe for directing us to Perfect for find that arrangement and it speaks truly not just to fathers but with every one of us who follows Christ because that is the example that we are molded in men and women from all walks of life no matter how much you have or have been given how much your blessings have uh, at this time, I want us to come together in prayer, and we will conclude with the Lord's Prayer, and we will leave a space to lift up those individuals who are in special need of prayer, or whom we just want to thank. Please join me. Lord in heaven, we give you thanks for this creation that we live in. We give you thanks for showing us that your love really is unconditional. Lord, we ask that you return us to your presence so that we may be closer to you and acknowledge your love and presence. Lord, we especially pray for Nate and Colleen as they uh, begin their lives together. We pray for your example to follow, and we pray for the family that they begin in coming together. Lord, we pray for Ben and Suda and their new family. Lord, we pray for their beautiful young daughter. We pray that they raise her and that they can see your presence in that. Lord, we pray for Lonnie. We pray for his healing. We pray for Bill Timmons. We pray for his healing. We pray that you give them patience and strength as they heal. Lord, we pray for Joyce Wilson on the passing of her mother who helped raise her. Lord, we pray that you heal this part of her heart. And Lord, now we lift up so many others who are on our hearts and minds, both silently and out loud. For Bill and Judy Buth, Scott Cameron, And Lord, we give you thanks for all those who have guided us in your image. And Lord, now we pray together for the daily strength that you give. Praying now as one people, the prayer your Son taught us to pray. Praying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we forgive the debtors, and lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Well, as we conclude, uh, we will sing one final hymn. A few verses. This will be from uh, Eternal Father, Strong to Save. And as we do so, I want you to think of God's creation as it is uh, throughout this great hymn. You might recognize it as the Navy hymn. Three verses. Yeah, we'll do three verses. Okay. Uh, which one is six? Is that what you want to do? You're six. Yeah, what, what uh, number is it? Oh, oh uh, 679. Perfect. Uh, I should have this all. Yeah, it's all right. down.
out in peace. Return no one evil for evil. Bless those who persecute you. Bless them. Do not uh, curse them. That way you will heap burning coals on their head. But not in a bad way. It is the only way for us to exhibit true righteousness in God's eyes and reserve judgment for the Father. God bless you all. Happy Father's Day, and I hope to see all of you again soon next Sunday.